morning. If you turn to Philippians chapter 4, Philippians 4, <clears throat> just a moment, we'll, we'll read several of these verses here. We'll actually read 10 through 20, but our focus today is Philippians 4, 13. So our society has largely celebrated uh, personal achievement and personal strength uh, and optimism, and nobody likes to be told that they can't do something, which is why we tell people, um, we lie right to their face. You can do anything you put your mind to. Okay, we know their minds. We know they're not going to be able to do anything they put their mind to. Okay, <clears throat> and, but, but that sounds nicer than, you know what, that's just not in the cards for you. You're just not physically able to do that. You're probably not smart enough to go that direction. So we just tell people, you can do anything that you put your mind to, because to tell them otherwise would be rude. Now, put on top of that Christian theology. The idea that we serve an almighty, all-powerful God, that Christ has come and died on the cross and been raised from the dead and redeemed us and made us his own and then put himself inside of us in the person of the Holy Spirit. So we have the spirit of the almighty God living inside of us. Some people uh, might say that we should actually even have more confidence uh, than anybody else that we can truly achieve anything that we put our minds to because after all, we have the all-powerful living God, living inside of us. Well, it's that mindset that leads us to the verse we'll look at today, a verse that is often used to support the belief that we as Christians can do or accomplish anything, and that's Philippians 4.13, which says, this is Paul writing, he says, I can do all things through him, that is Christ, who gives me strength. So this verse has been really the rallying cry for Success. It's the athlete who wants to win the championship that claims this verse. It's the person that wants the job promotion that claims this verse. It's the student that wants the certain GPA to get into college uh, to claim this verse. If you have a personal goal of some, time, of some kind, many people will claim this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But is this the correct way to view this verse? What if I told you, for example, and I think I've used this illustration before, but just remember, what if I told you that tomorrow I'm going to try out for the Pacers? Okay? Exactly. You're already laughing. I'm going to, it's like, I don't care if they all go down with COVID, they're not going to put you on the court. All right? So, so what if I, what if I go out for the Pacers? Okay? And I've got a shirt, I'm going to wear my shirt that says Philippians 4.13, because after all, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A scenario like that automatically tells us that this verse probably doesn't mean what we initially think uh, that, it, that it means. We all know that loving Jesus, no matter how much we love him, doesn't mean that we're without limitations, physical limitations, financial limitations, um, uh, we're mental limitations. I'm not going to be a pacer, and there was no way I was going to be a neurosurgeon. Okay, There were just certain things that knowing my makeup and knowing my limitations, I was not going to be. So... We know kind of instinctively when we look at this verse, while we claim it as a rallying cry for success, it probably doesn't mean what most people think that it means. So how are we to use this verse appropriately? Well, let's think about the context first of Philippians. There's two things about the book of Philippians that you need to always keep in mind when you're reading any scripture in the book of Philippians. Okay, The apostle Paul wrote it, first of all, while in jail. Okay, So he's in prison writing this. The second thing is the theme of the book of Philippians is joy. All right, so Paul is writing a letter to a group of people, to Christians, about joy, his joy and the joy that they can have while he is in prison. What had happened was Paul had some financial needs. When you were in prison, okay, and it's this way in other places as well, when you're in prison, that you depended on somebody, in this time, you depended on somebody else to meet your needs. They had to bring you food. If you need medicine, they brought it. You had to have people looking out for you, okay? Um, so the, the Philippians had sent him a financial gift to help meet his needs. So we're going to look at that in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20, if you'd please stand. Here's what Paul says while writing from prison to the Philippians. He says, I rejoiced, there's that theme of joy, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me, but you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Yet it was kind of you to share in my troubles, 
And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into a partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. You can be seated. So the Philippians have been concerned for Paul for a while. From the beginning of their relationship, they have kind of supported Paul. There have been times where they did not have the opportunity to send him some kind of financial gift to meet his needs, but now they have, and this gift has been delivered. And Paul, while he appreciates the gift, he wants them to know, you don't have to worry about me. Okay? You don't have to worry about trying to make me happy or make me content with this gift. I've had a lot. I've had a little. I know how to be content in all circumstances. And then he says, I'm glad you sent me the gift for your sake. Because God's going to bless you for this gift. So that is the sort of the context of what we are looking here. The context actually is talking about real physical needs and potential situations where those needs may not be met, at least not immediately or in the way that maybe we thought they would have been met or hoped they would have been met. And that in that context, you can still maintain contentment and joy in those situations. So let me give you four points here to remember Uh, regarding Philippians 4.13. I know we don't have a PowerPoint, so I've already put in my notes uh, for this week when I email you the weekly reminder. I'm going to try and figure out some way to either send you the PowerPoint or send you a copy of the PowerPoint slides so that you can have these scriptures. But if you just want to jot down these four notes and whatever scriptures come to mind as I read them out, you can do that. But hopefully I'll be able to forward those notes to you. So here's the first point, and it really is the meaning of Philippians 4.13, and we will build from there. The first point is this. We can find contentment in all circumstances through Jesus. That's what Philippians 4.13 is saying. We can find contentment, and I might even add joy, true joy in all circumstances through Jesus. This is not a a verse to motivate one towards success. It's one to remind us that in any circumstance we go through, through Christ's strength, we can be content. We can do all things. We can face all circumstances. Okay, this is not the verse to be claimed by the quarterback who wants to win the Super Bowl. This is the verse to be claimed by the quarterback who just lost the Super Bowl on his interception. All right. Whenever you see the losing quarterback of a, of a Super Bowl, their head's always down, and I wish we'd have you know, done better. You know, Philippians 4.13 would allow that quarterback to sit with their head up straight and go, hey, I got to play in the Super Bowl. This was great. And you know what? I'm not any happier now than if we'd have won the Super Bowl. Now, they would be thought of as a bad teammate or a bad athlete if they said that. But that's what Philippians 4.13 is saying, that no matter the circumstances, you can be content no matter what they are. What does the word contentment mean? It means basically to be satisfied or at ease. So think about in your life moments where you're really content. Okay, so some of you are already thinking about the Sunday afternoon nap. All right, I'm going to be really content in my Sunday afternoon nap. I like Sunday afternoon naps. And then... Sometimes I think about contentment. I think about a day, about the temperature. Like, this is getting a little warm for me right now, but if the temperature could stay about 70, 75 degrees, sunny, slight breeze, sitting out under the shade tree out in the middle of the country, sipping on a a glass of sweet tea, to me, that's contentment. An afternoon or a weekend where there's nothing really on the calendar and I have the freedom to do whatever I want, contentment. Spending an afternoon, you know, with my family or going on a walk with Pam or something, that's Those are just moments where you think, man, I'm just content. I'm at ease. I'm satisfied. Life is good. Well, Paul said we can have this feeling when we are brought low or when we abound, when we face plenty or when we hunger, when we have abundance or when there is need, that our ability to be satisfied and at ease or content is not based on circumstances. It's based on Christ who gives us strength to maintain that level of contentedness no matter the circumstances. I want to read to you some commands that we have in Scripture that I'm convinced they can't be achieved unless you have strength in Christ. Many of you, you've heard these before. Let's start again with my least favorite verse in the Bible. Do all things without grumbling or complaining. How do you do all things, all things, without any grumbling and any complaining apart from strength in Christ? You don't have the power in yourself to do it. All right, what about... Let our speech always be gracious. 
Now, some of you, think about some of the people in your life that you deal with on a daily basis. Some of you may be sitting next to them for all I know. You're thinking, how do I, how do I have gracious speech always? Well, the only way to do that is through Christ's strength. What about rejoicing always or giving thanks in all circumstances? Always, all circumstances, in all things, our contentedness and attitude should not be impacted by those circumstances. Now, remember, the opposite is true. If we're always to be content and even joyful, that means, conversely, we are never to be discontent. So you can't always be content, but sometimes be discontent. You're one or the other. If we're always to be content, the flip side of that is, then that means there's never a time to be discontent. The Christian should be the least shaken, the least thrown off by circumstances, the last to complain, the most content, and the first to smile all the time. That should be the attitude of the Christian. And then when difficult circumstances do come into your life or come into another person's life and you want to encourage them, using Philippians 4.13 correctly, you say, I know your circumstances are difficult, but good or bad, you can have contentedness and even joy through Christ because he will give you the strength to do so. So that's the, first, that's the meaning of, of Philippians 4.13, that in all circumstances, no matter what they are, you have the ability to maintain that contentedness. Now that leads us to the second point. Our ability to maintain this contentedness or joy in all circumstances is an indicator of the strength of our faith and our love for Christ. So our ability to maintain this contentedness in all circumstances is actually an indicator of the strength of our faith and our love for Christ. It is our faith in Christ and our strength in Christ that is most adequately and accurately tested and revealed during difficult times. Okay, your true contentedness in Christ cannot be revealed apart from difficult times. That's why First Peter, Peter wrote in First Peter 1, 6 and 7, that the genuineness of our faith is tested by fire or through various trials. So you only know the strength of your faith and the level of your faith during difficult times. Anybody can be content and happy when things are going well. That doesn't take any effort, any spiritual strength whatsoever. It's contentedness and gratitude and joy during difficult times that takes Christ's strength. And stressful times test us. What happens is we have our spiritual temperature taken during difficult times. So everybody here looks pretty content. All right, so you're pretty content. The weather's great. The humidity's not near what we thought it was going to be. There was a chance of rain, and that left the, the forecast a few hours ago. So we're very content. So this contentedness you're feeling now... All right, if something happens today and it throws that off, that means your contentedness is based in your circumstances and not in Christ. All right, so, so whatever your level of contentedness is, or think about one of those moments I told you about before when you're most content. When a situation comes in your life and it throws you off, that means your contentedness is in circumstances and not in Christ. So you should be able to maintain your level of joy and your level of contentedness no matter the circumstances. That's what trials do. They test, they're like, uh, they test your contentedness temperature. All right? They, they, they see where, where do you really stand. And if you can go through a difficult time and still maintain joy and contentment, then your faith and your trust and your hope and your strength is in Christ. But if circumstances make you wobble, then when that happens to us, we recognize our faith and our, and our hope and our strength really isn't in Christ. It's in the circumstances. We have to have things a certain way. Our life has to be balanced a certain way in order to make us content. There's a very convicting and blunt proverb. Proverbs 24.10 says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you faint in the day of adversity, if your situation throws you off when something goes bad, your faith is small. Now, no one likes to go through difficulty but it really is a gift of God because it's the only way that we can measure the true strength of our faith. Can we maintain joy and can we maintain contentedness during stressful times? Or do we allow circumstances to rob us of our joy in Christ? Where is our true joy? These questions can only be answered through testing. Now, a few weeks ago, I made a statement regarding how decisions were being made regarding church activities in the midst of this virus crisis. And I read from you. I read to you Hebrews 10, and I want to revisit that text because I think these people that, that the writer of Hebrews highlights and sets as an example teach us a lot in how they reacted to their circumstances about contentedness. They had their contentedness temperature 
uh, checked by their circumstances. And here's what it says in Hebrews 10, 32 to 39. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, that's after you became a Christian, you endured a hard struggle with suffering. So he said, after you became a Christian, your life got harder. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those who were so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. These, these people were thrown in prison for their faith. And then it says, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which is a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and preserve their souls. So these were people who were wrongly having basically their property repossessed for being Christians. People were coming in and taking their property. And they, they didn't just endure it, but it says they joyfully accepted it. All right, now just think, put yourself in their shoes for a minute. And you're being persecuted for being a Christian, and the government's coming in and taking your possessions. First of all, some of you are saying, we're going to fight. Okay? Some of you are saying, well, I might let them do it, but I'm not going to be happy about it. These people basically showed them to the big screen TV and said, I take it. Doesn't matter if I have it or not. I'm content with it. I'm content without it. You want the furniture? Take it. I'm content with it. I'm content without it. Because their hearts and their joy was on the future to come. They knew that their lasting possessions, their eternal inheritance in Christ was secure. They thought, just, just take it. They joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. I mean, that's, I can't imagine much else worse than that, other than maybe being separated from my family. Than just having people come in and ransack your house and take your property for no righteous reason. And it says they had no, they had no issues with it. You know? Now, we think we're more spiritual because we're going to fight. We're going to stand up. They just said, okay, just, that's fine. It, it didn't even phase them. They went back to whatever they were doing when it was done. Well, unless it was watching the big screen TV, then they didn't go back to that. But they found something else to do you know, because their contentedness wasn't based in their circumstances. They passed the contentedness test. And again, that's why trials are beneficial to us. We don't like them. Nobody likes them. I'm not a, I mean... You know, nobody likes it, but the, it matters because that's really where our faith is tested and we see the genuineness of our faith. Third, having the basics in your life should be more than enough to satisfy us. Having the basics in our life should be more than enough to satisfy us. So reasonably, let's ask the question, what should we need to be content? Because Paul apparently went through times of want and times of plenty. He wasn't always in need. We can relate to that when, hey... We had a little bit more money than we thought we were going to have, and then times where we thought we didn't have enough, times when you open the refrigerator and it's full, and you think, what am I going to have for dinner? Because there's hams and roast and pork chops and chicken and, and hamburger meat and vegetables, and then times when you open up the refrigerator and there's a half pound of hamburger and a jar of mayonnaise, and you're like, what's going to be for dinner? Because you really don't know. I mean, we've all been in sort of these circumstances. Paul was in this, and he said, so what does it need to be content? Well, we're given some pretty good hints from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. So he says, This is a great goal for you, Timothy. It's a great gain. Be godly, and with that godliness have contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothes, we will be content. Paul said, if I have food and clothes, I'll be content. This actually reminds me of the people we just read about in Hebrews chapter 10. I mean, they were, they were content. Food and clothes, we have content. Everybody here is dressed. Thank you very much. Everybody here uh, is probably going to have lunch. If you can't afford lunch, look at the person next to you and tell them. They'll help you out. But nobody here has to worry about what they're going to eat today. We should all be perfectly content. There should be nothing bothering us. Nothing rattling us, just happy, glad to be alive, perfectly content. We've got food, we've got clothes. This scripture in 1 Timothy is actually strikingly similar to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. And I won't read all that, but he talks to us about not being anxious because he says we shouldn't worry because God will give us what we need to eat and what we need to wear. So there it is again, food and clothes. 
So it looks like to me, if you know you're going to eat, and if you know you have clothes, there's no reason not to be content in life. There's no reason not to be perfectly happy. Now that brings me to two questions. The first is sort of just a reflective question. How much more do you have than most people? Let's just start with food and clothes for a minute. How, many, how much more food do you have at home right now than most people around the world have? How, many more, how much more clothes do you have than most people? Most of us could not do laundry for a week, if not two weeks, and be fine. You know, we'd have plenty, plenty to wear. We, we may not have to go to the grocery store for a couple of weeks and we'd be fine. Now, we might not have everything we want, but we would not starve. Okay, I mean, a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter go a long ways. All right? <clears throat> so, we have more. And then, on top of that, we have temperature-controlled homes. We have cars. We have basic security. We have technology. We have access to medicine if we need it. We have experiences. We have gadgets and gizmos aplenty everywhere that we look. We've got all these things that we, that we look at and, and, and phones and computers and multiple forms of entertainment. So how much more do you have than most people? That's where you need to start. And what's been the most convicting to me is I've talked to people and I've had the privilege of going to other countries, talking to other Christians, uh, even for, for those of you that, that don't know, some things going on at Maranatha Baptist Church, the church plant we support, where the storm that came through this week, I was on the phone with Emmanuel, and the church steeple starts falling apart. The tiles are coming off into the road. That guy, you can, you can see him smile on the phone. Okay? I mean, he, he's, he's, you can see him smile. He's, all that's going on there, they're having church probably for the first time today in four months. And it's not that he... That, that's not difficult for him to go through this thing, but you just, the joy that's there is really convicting. So people that are going through way worse circumstances than us, that have way fewer things than us, you go to other countries where they have way less possessions and they're perfectly content. Which brings me to the kind of the next question is, why do we struggle so much with contentment? We aren't just content when we lack, because we really don't lack. We're discontent all the time. Even in the midst of great accommodations, <coughs> excuse me, and blessing, we are discontent. And if our lives get knocked down just a notch, you know, if, if, we, if we're content in the, and our lives get knocked down just a notch, boy, we just revolt. We just don't know how to handle this. All right? We, we just can't, can't deal with it. All right? We don't even bother. Our vision gets about this big because we can't even see the rest of the world and the people around us and all the things that we have to be thankful for. It just gets this narrow. And I'll tell you who we are. OK, a lot of times any situation you think of in your life, whether it's a job situation, the current situation, uh, having to meet outside versus inside, all of this stuff we're going through. Who we are is we're the rich kid who lives in the mansion and went to the private institution whose dad got demoted and they had to move. But they moved to the best neighborhood in, in, in the town and he still went to the best public school in the town, but thinks they moved to the slums. That's who we are. That's, that's who we are. That's how quick we get shaken up. That's how bad things get for us. So why we have to ask, how much more do we have than others, which is obvious, and then why do we struggle so much with contentment? It wasn't any different in Paul's days, the sins and temptations of coveting and want and, and the temptation of dissatisfaction when all was all there, and Paul said this, I ate, I'm dressed, life is good. I ate, I, I, I dre I'm dressed, life is good. By not being content or not believing we can be content, we do two things, okay? And, and we actually do them both simultaneously, whether we realize it or not. The first is we miss out on the joy that we could have that was meant for us. Every moment you're complaining, every moment you're discontent, you're not having the joy that you were meant to have in Christ. So you're, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot there. All right, well, I'm not happy. Well, you've chosen not to tap into the strength that Christ has given you to be content. And the second thing is maybe a little worse, and that is you call God a liar. Because God's the one that says, in Christ, you can have the power to be content. It's there for you. And you say, no, I got to have something else. I got to have something else. So... <clears throat> that brings us to the fourth point. A lack of contentedness and joy 
will only bring you and those around you more misery. A lack of contentedness and joy are, is only going to bring you and those around you more misery. You all know the saying, misery loves company. Okay, so your lack of contentedness will only bring others down with you. Now, if you have a person in your life who brings you down, you know, and you just kind of dread being around them because they always bring you down, I would be the first to tell you, well, now you're not following Philippians 4.13 because you're letting somebody else steal your joy. Okay? But having said that, I would then tell each of us, don't be the person who makes it more difficult for another person to be content with their circumstances. You want people to look forward to you coming into a room. Okay? Not regret you showed up. All right. Now, this is something for all of us, especially in our own homes, especially as parents and as moms and dads. But it applies to, to, to children, especially to older children and the teens. Are they glad you show up? Or are they, would they just kind of wish you would stay away? All right. So we don't want to be the person who makes it more difficult for a per, another person to be content. We're not islands. Okay. Our moods, our attitudes, they impact others. They either make it easier for a person to be content or they make it more difficult for another person to be content. And we're going to influence other people. So you have to recognize that the way you process things around you and your level of contentment and your level of joy is going to influence or have the potential to impact other people's level of contentedness and joy. It's still their, their, their contentedness and still joy is their, still their responsibility. All right. But again, you don't want to be the one that makes it more difficult. <clears throat> In 2 Timothy verses 1 and 4, uh, we find Paul writing about a man named... Ansiphorus, okay? And here's what he says about Ansiphorus in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. He says, May the Lord grant mercy on the household of Ansiphorus, for he refreshed me and was not afraid or ashamed, I'm sorry, he was not ashamed of my chains. So Ansiphorus was a person who was not ashamed to be associated with Paul, which some Christians were. I mean, when Paul started getting persecuted, a lot like Jesus, when Paul started getting persecuted and, and, and difficult things, some people just left him. But Ansiphorus was always there. Okay, and his presence refreshed Paul. Okay, so you can imagine this guy being supportive and encouraging and just sort of a joy to be around. When someone is a constant uh, complainer, okay, and always grumbling, nobody says of them, that person refreshes me. Okay, you say that person brings me down. Well, you're going to be one of two people to people around you. You're going to be the person who brings them down or you're going to be the person who refreshes other people. So your ability to be content in Christ in all circumstances will largely determine if you're an asiphorous to somebody else or not. You want to be the person who's good to be around. Okay? Now, um, we're not saying, you know, be unrealistic or gloss over difficulty or act as if circumstances aren't tough or ignore the circumstances as if we're not there. It's, about, it's not about ignoring circumstances. It's about overcoming circumstances. In fact, to be able to complete uh, Philippians 4.13, you have to recognize the reality of the circumstances. Okay, it is difficult. It is hard. It is a challenge. That's the first thing you have to recognize. Then you know you need the strength to keep you content and enjoy above those circumstances. Well, these people who are able for what, for, to, to kind of just tap into this ability to be content and, and joyful in Christ, they lift us up. They refresh us. They demonstrate to us the reality of Philippians 4.13, and then they challenge us to apply it to our own lives. What God does is he uses people uh, to move us, these type of people, to move us to a deepening dependence on Jesus for contentedness in all things. We see somebody go through something difficult. We know it's hard. We think, I can't imagine being in that situation, and yet they have joy and contentedness. Okay, And that should challenge us. To, to, to sometimes just talk to them and have a conversation, which I've actually done. I've gone to somebody's house who just was joyful all the time and said, how do you do this? Okay, how do you maintain this joy all the time, no matter the circumstance? Because I wanted to figure out how can I do that as well. All right, and then when you find out and it's just watching some of these people, they just kind of, it's convicting at first. You know, and you can do one of two things. You can just say, I could never be that way. Or you can say, you know what? I have got the same Holy Spirit living in me that they do. I can have the same level of contentedness that they have. I can have the same level of joy that they have. Instead of, we know, nobody here likes to excuse anybody else's sin, but how quickly we excuse our own. If you go back and read 1 Corinthians 10, 
one of the sins that God punished his people for, one of the big ones listed there with much what we would call worse sins, was grumbling and complaining. God does not take grumbling and complaining lightly. We want to point out all the ills of the world and all the ills of other Christians and terrible things they've done. When God sees our grumbling and our complaining and our discontent in the same light as he does all of these other sins that we like to point out. So you can be content in all circumstances through Christ who gives you strength. That's what, for, that's what Philippians 4.13 says. You can be content in all circumstances through Christ who gives you strength. You can have joy in all circumstances through Christ who gives you strength. You don't have to be bound by the circumstances to dictate your contentedness and your joy. But it's not anything natural that comes from you. It's supernatural through Christ that gives you strength. So if you've never put your faith in Christ and you're looking for contentment, it only comes through Christ. If you're searching for that which is going to give you peace between you and God, that only comes through Christ. It's, it's Christ that will overcome your sin through his death and his resurrection. You're simply called to put your faith in Christ. You're simply called to believe he died on the cross for your sins, that he was raised from the dead. And then this peace is made between you and God, and you now have the ability to be content in all circumstances. And in the circumstances you recognize, well, why am I not content? You'll at least have the ability to recognize it as a sin and then to fight against it or do something about it. And then for those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus, we need to understand that Christ has guaranteed the strength for us to endure even when we don't get our desires, to carry us through any circumstances, and not just to carry us, but through that to actually give us contentedness and joy. All right, so it's not just about enduring. Remember, that, that text in Hebrews 10 doesn't just say they endured. It says endurance was important, but it says they joyfully accepted what happened. So you can endure, yes, but you can also endure with joy. I think about, and the, and the uh, writer of Hebrews uses this in Hebrews 12, running a race. Okay, we're running a race. Well, somebody who likes to run, guess what? They have to endure. Is there some suffering involved for them? Yes, they're having to breathe heavy and they're running. But you also know what? People who like to run, they endure and they run with joy. Even though they're outputting a lot of energy, even though there's a lot of uh, sweat involved and hard work and they're challenging themselves, you know, and then sometimes it's even difficult, they run with joy. Well, that's what we're supposed to do in life. There's difficulty, there are challenges, but it should not mess with our joy. So one of the things I might do occasionally over the next few weeks is when I look at these texts, try to figure out how it applies to our current situation. I was studying this this morning and overlooked this, and here's what I realized. I don't know how many of you have taken a COVID-19 test, okay? I don't want to know, okay? Um, especially if you showed up positive, all right? I don't want to know, all right? But I don't know how many of you have taken it. Most, most of us probably have not. Some of us may have. But let me just say this. We've all taken the COVID-19 contentment test. So I would ask how you're doing. We've all been faced this challenge. It's affected us all. This is the test that God has given us. Everybody has taken that test. And after, based on Philippians 4.13, how are you doing? How's your contentedness? How's your joy? Has it been impacted by this? Has it been negatively impacted by this? I mean, nobody's saying it's easy. I'm not overlooking the circumstances. But at some point, you've got to get beyond that and say, we can still be content. We can still have joy. And we really should not be. Our level of joy and contentedness can't be dictated by our circumstances. Christ has died so that that doesn't have to be the case. He's, God has given us this joy, this promise of contentedness. And also, if Paul can be content in prison, suffering for sharing the gospel with just the shirt on his back, and what he ate, no matter what it was just a few minutes ago before he read this, what right do we have not to be content in all circumstances? If you'd bow your heads. This is a huge challenge for us in our society and our culture because we are so spoiled. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be grateful for what we have or that we should just necessarily throw it to the wind like it doesn't matter. It does mean, however, we need to recognize that we are products, just like everybody else, of our culture. And our expectations have been set higher than the Bible has said they should be set.
and then everything that's going on around us in our personal lives, whether it's the current situation in our country with the virus, whether it's the, the unrest in our culture, the uncertainty of the future, you know, circumstances in our own personal lives, dealing with families and difficulties and illnesses and tragedies. And our, our, the promise is we can have contentment in all things. We can be at ease. We can be satisfied. Just like you're sitting under the shade tree, sipping on the sweet tea. You can be that satisfied in any situation that you find yourself in. And when you say, no, I can't, the first thing I tell you is you're right. You can't. And I can't. But then the next thing that we forget is Philippians 4.13. But we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So it's good you can admit you can't do it, but that's not so you can be excused. That should push you toward and run you toward Christ. Father, we do have a lot to be thankful for, a lot to be grateful for. And I pray that you would help us find that contentedness and that joy that can only come through Christ. And for those who have not put their faith in Christ, Lord, that they would be convicted and understand that the joy they're seeking, the contentedness they're seeking, even the power to have some kind of depth of joy and hope in difficult circumstances will only come when they put their faith in Christ. That it doesn't mean your life is going to go worse. In fact, we see from Hebrews and we see from Philippians and other texts we read, it actually means your life could be situationally more difficult. But what it does mean is that the joy and the contentedness and the peace is no longer then dictated by the circumstances. Because you put yourself in us through the Holy Spirit. We thank you for Jesus' sacrifice and we thank you for his death on the cross and the promise of the resurrection and all the promises that it secures for us both in the future and today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.